What's up, you guys? My name is Mikko Kraszowski, and welcome to episode 86 of That Remote Life Podcast, where we hear from location-independent entrepreneurs and professionals so you can learn to quit the cubicle and live life on your terms. Today on the podcast, we're joined by Phil Libin, the co-founder and CEO of All Turtles and Mm-hmm. Phil started All Turtles in 2017 to create products that address real-world problems using cutting-edge technology. When COVID forced businesses to move to using video on a daily basis, they decided to make their newest app called Mm-hmm in order to make video communication more clear and compelling. Prior to All Turtles and Mm-hmm, Phil was the co-founder and CEO of the popular app Evernote, growing the product to hundreds of millions of users under his leadership. Now, during this interview, Phil and I got to discuss what made him and his team create Mm Mm-hmm and why they're positioning it to be a game-changing app in the video call business world and video content creation in general. We also discussed his thoughts on where life, the economy, and working is heading post-COVID and why calling yourself a remote worker will be obsolete before the decade is done. I had a lot of fun and I honestly learned a lot during this conversation and I think you will as well. Now, before we jump into this episode, I would like to take a second and ask you to please head over to Apple Podcasts or your favorite equivalent and leave us an honest review. If you're enjoying this podcast, it is the number one way to support us. Reviews are still a key statistic that Apple looks at in order to determine how to rank a podcast. So your review will directly help us climb the rank boards and attract new listeners. So I want to say thank you ahead of time for leaving a review if you do choose to do so. If you want to check out the full show notes and list of resources mentioned on on this episode, you can do so over at thatremotelife.com forward slash episode 86. That's episode all spelled out followed by the number 86. All right, you guys, without further ado, let's dive into this wide ranging conversation with Phil Libin from Mm -hmm. All right, Phil, welcome to the show, man. Uh, It's such a pleasure to have you here. Hey, it's great to be here. Yeah, you're the uh, founder of uh, the company that I think has the coolest name by far. It's called Mm Mm-hmm, and we're going to uh, talk about it for sure. But before we kind of dive into that, um, I was doing research for this podcast, and I wanted to kind of off the bat talk about something that's pretty interesting to me because it seems like we have a similar background in that you were born in the USSR Mm -hmm. and moved to the US when you were eight, correct? That is right. So I was born in Bulgaria, uh, hmm. not part of the you know Soviet bloc, but I was kind of behind the Iron Curtain, or at least my parents were growing up. Um, and I moved to the U.S. when I was ten, and I was curious. You know, you've you're the ex CEO of uh, Evernote, and you've had a lot of success in Silicon Valley. And I'm curious, what sort of um, you know influence do you think growing up in the USSR and then moving to the U.S. as an immigrant? What kind of influence that have on you and do you feel like it gave you a chip on your shoulder that kind of has been a drive for you uh well first i i, I wouldn't say that i've had a lot of success i think i've you know had a, a modest amount of success but um i i don't know i don't i don't i mean there's a lot of immigrants who are uh who become entrepreneurs uh, there's probably something uh to that um i think it's just the sense of uh you know, not quite being comfortable, not quite belonging that leads, you know, people to, to take an entrepreneurial track. But, you know, again, the sample size is, is maybe not big enough to draw conclusions like that. So I have definitely uh, been keenly aware of myself being an immigrant and actually a refugee. We were, we were technically refugees wow. uh, that, uh, that came over. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure that's affected all sorts of things. Um, but I couldn't, uh, I, don't, I don't know that I could make scientifically verifiable statements based on that. Have you ever been back to Russia? Yeah, um, mm-hmm. I haven't in, in in a while. But I think probably the last time at Evernote we had a, we had a team in 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 Moscow, uh, and so I would go back relatively frequently. But uh, I probably haven't been there in six or seven years, maybe more now. Yeah, probably seven eight years. Um, it's kind of a shame. Uh, it would be it would be nice to 
to go back a little bit more frequently, but that doesn't seem to be in the cards anytime soon. Sure. And when you, so when you moved from, uh, you know, USSR, now Russia, where did you move to in the US and um, what was like, you know, what was it like for you in school and stuff like that? Uh, well, uh, we moved to New York, uh, we settled in the Bronx, uh, kind of right in the middle of the Bronx in a place called Parkchester, which is kind of this sort of a project. And, uh, it was a pretty bad neighborhood. I was there in the, I'm, I think I'm a lot older than you. So, you know, I was growing up in the, in the early eighties there and it was mm -hmm. kind of at the height of the bad times in New York. So it was a pretty, uh, pretty bad neighborhood, pretty dangerous, uh, you know, a lot of gang activity, but, uh, the gangs wouldn't have me, so I just basically stayed at home and you know played around <laughs> with my computer. So it didn't affect me too much, other than I didn't get didn't get to go outside very much. And so you know, you said that you were playing around with your computer, and it's interesting because um, I've become very uh, a very big follower of Naval Ravikant. If I'm assuming you know Naval Ravikant, and um, you know he has he kind of has a very similar background that he said a lot. You know, like he grew up in a bad part of town and that he spent a lot of his time in the library and that that really kind of forced him into kind of his life. Um, so is that kind of when you became inspired to start working with technology and computers? Well, you know, I was definitely, yeah, spending most of my time inside and, and, you know, my friends were all, I was just very nerdy growing up. I mean, still am, but I was kind of the, 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 the canonical, uh, you know, nerdy, uncoordinated uh, kids. So the friends that I had were all also giant nerds, and you know, we tended to hang out and you know play around with our with our Atari or Commodore sixty four computers, and you know trade pirated video games, and you know use red boxes to make free phone calls. To, to the kinds of stuff that nerds did in the uh, early to mid eighties, uh, and uh, yeah, it was great. Okay, I learned a lot uh, by doing that. Um, uh, like all of my friends were, were kind of in that, in that group of people. Uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was an interesting time to, to grow up. Uh, I've been back, you know, I, I, I kind of came by the old neighborhood a couple of times since then, but it's, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's you know, more or less hasn't changed. A lot of New York has gotten, you know, tremendously better, but uh, where, where we were is, you know, it's more or less like still very, very much recognizable. It's kind of interesting. It's an interesting feeling being back there, although I haven't been there probably in 10 years now, so I don't know. How it's changed since you know it's saying that you grew up a nerd and that you know you kind of hung out with your nerd friends and that kind of stuff i'm curious what do you think about kind of like the nerd culture has become cool you know in in recent years what is kind of your take on that yeah it's interesting it's it's it it, it went through a phase where it, it became kind of cool i don't know that it's i don't know if it, if it still is um uh you know a lot of but but I don't actually know if it's actually cool, right? Like think about it like this: like when I was in you know in in elementary school and high school, like that's when you really feel I think the alienation. Mm. Uh, and I don't know that like I don't know that nerds in school in high school or in you know sixth grade or whatever today have an easier time than than we did. I think uh, it's probably kind of the same. I think like in retrospect, a lot of people who are kind of you know, book smart and, and introverted, you know, some of us managed to, 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 uh, you know, get further in life as adults. Um, and so maybe in hindsight, you can be like, oh yeah, look, it's like, you know, Bill Gates and people like that are kind of like, you know, have, have managed to, to, to carve out a pretty good life. Do some uh, pretty cool I, stuff. Yeah. yeah. But I don't, I don't know that that means that it's actually still easier when you're, when it matters, which is when you're a kid, mm -hmm. which is when you're developing. You know, like, yeah, I, I, I definitely stopped getting beat up and picked on, you know, at some point in my you know, early 40s, probably. <laughs> but <laughs> um, it, it, it's probably still just as bad for a 14 year old. So how did you, you know, you're probably best known for being the CEO of Evernote. Um, how did you how did that come to happen? Um, you know, you came out of college and then you moved to San Francisco, I assume. But how did the founding of Evernote really happen? It was actually my third startup. So um, I started uh, started my first company in '97. Uh, mm -hmm. I was a co-founder of a company called Engine Five. With uh, two co-founders were college college friends of mine uh, from Boston University, and we were one of the early e-commerce companies. Uh, and then we sold that. Uh, got really lucky, kind of right at the height of the original dot-com boom. Started our second company together, which is called Core Street, which was a security company. Sold that. Uh, and then we're kind of sitting around trying to figure out what we wanted to do next. And um, 
ran into this guy, Stefan Pacheco, who had, who had a company in California. Uh, it's called Evernote, but Evernote with a, with a capital N. Uh, and uh, we started working on a similar idea, this idea of like a cognitive prosthesis, the second brain. And uh, when I met Stefan, we kind of just decided to join forces. So we kind of recreated the new company um, as Evernote. Uh, I moved my team out to California and uh, became the CEO of it. And we just sort of rebooted uh, that organization. So it, it, you know, it came together after was already a bunch of people, both on my side and Stefan's side that have been working on similar ideas. But by then that was 2007. So I, that was already 10 years after we first started. Um, mm. Yeah. It, it all goes by fast. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's insane how quickly kind of time moves. And I actually had a friend who said, um, he said, if you ever notice that when you're bored and you're not doing something interesting time almost feels like it goes by faster but when you're working on something that you're interested in it tends to move slower in the moment do you agree with that like have you ever felt that like when you're working on something you're really passionate about time almost seems to kind of like you look back at it and you say wow i can't believe how little time has passed and how many things i've done the perception of time is very non-linear and, and non-monolithic uh, i think mm -hmm. it's a it's just an illusion in fact it's probably more linguistic because we just use the same word to refer to it as you know time as if it were one thing but the perception of that is actually very multivariate and uh, certain things looking back seem like they took forever certain things seem like they went by like that they kind of fold together it's a uh, yeah it's a very it's a very experiential and non-linear thing it's actually a bunch of interesting research on this but yeah uh, basically uh, at the end of the day everything goes by too fast uh, the mm -hmm. things the things that drag on I don't remember as having dragged on. So all of the things that I remember are the things that, that went by too fast. Mm. What are some of the, you know, you've, you've operated, you've run Evernote, which is a pretty large company. What are some of the top lessons that you, maybe like the top three lessons that you walked away from Evernote kind of learning? Being an entrepreneur, you know, starting a company, running a company is, is a really, really, really difficult thing. Um, and um, it doesn't get easier. Uh, it probably gets harder. So, you know, I'm on my fifth. Mm -hmm, this is my fifth startup. It's, it's, it gets harder every time. Um, and that may be counterintuitive. I think people kind of maybe don't expect this. They expect, especially if you've been a little bit successful before, they kind of say, well, you, know, you must know more of what you're doing. It must be easier, but it's not. Um, you know, it's kind of like, um, imagine you're a skier, right? And you're like in your early 20s and you're just a great skier. I am definitely not. A, I am a dedicated endorsement, but let's just say you're a great skier. And, you know, you kind of ski very, uh, you know, a lot in your early 20s and you're doing, you know, bumps and jumps and all of that stuff. And, you know, you're really good at it. And you kind of know that you're banging up your knees, but, you know, you do it anyway. And, um, you know, and then you flash forward a few decades and now you're in your 40s and 50s and you're still a good skier, but no one expects you to be able to do the same thing on skis as you did in your 20s because they're like, yeah, you've had 30 years of like banging your knees around. Like obviously, even though you have more experience, like you know more about skiing over the past 30 years, you have more experience, but you're certainly not going to be at the same level of performance. It's definitely going to be harder because you have physically damaged your body. It's actually kind of the same thing about entrepreneurship. Uh, there's a lot of like repetitive uh, cognitive, you know, damage and injury that happens. And, um, you know, people expect it for knees because they kind of think oh your knees are hardware so of course you know as you get older and as you bang them around they get damaged but somehow people think that your brain is maybe software but it's not your brain is just as physical an organ it's just as much hardware as your knees are and it takes just as much damage and so you you bang it around for a few decades and you know running a startup is an extremely extremely intense thing and it doesn't get easier and so you know what you're doing in your 40s and 50s i'm 48 now um, what you're doing kind of at, at, at my age as an entrepreneur um, is not easier. It's harder than doing the same stuff in our, you know, in, in, in our 20s. Uh, and so the main point of all that is, is like, don't do it unless you can't not do it. Mm, <laughs> like, right. only reason I could actually, like, the only reason I'd ever like decide again to Subject start a company yourself or, to it yeah, yeah it's like because <laughs> i can't not do it because i'm working on something that i think is fundamentally important for the world um mm -hmm. that was a that was i guess the main lesson is like it's so hard and it only gets harder that it's only worth doing if you really really believe in what you're doing 
Yeah, it's interesting because I do feel like a lot of first time or young entrepreneurs do tend to think like, oh, if only I had a better network or if only, you know, like it's easy for this guy because he's already had some success. And I, I had this conversation with a friend of mine, Dan Andrews, who uh, runs a really great podcast called Tropical MBA. Mm-hmm. And he talked about the fact that they, you know, exited their previous company and they were kind of trying to decide what to do next. And they had a similar experience to you where they were like, oh, just because we have a great network and some money doesn't necessarily mean that things are going to be easier. In fact, he almost felt like in some ways it was harder because he didn't really have that like, that financial hunger, that like back up against the wall type of thing going on. Yeah, I don't, I don't like, uh, I don't, I do definitely see it as harder. Uh, I don't see it as, and it's not because I'm not financially hungry. I think it's because, uh, you know, expectations are higher. Mm. Um, That's a big deal. But also like, again, think about it, like think of it as your knees. (laughs) Like Mm. it's the same thing. Like if you're, if you've been, if you have been playing uh, you know, a physical sport intensively for decades, your body is just not going to be in the same shape. You know, you're not going to be the same in your 30s as you were in your 20s. You're not going to be the same in your 40s as you were in your 20s and your 50s. Right. It's the exact same thing mentally. Like There is nothing about your brain that somehow magically makes it immune from the kind of stresses. And so you know, just like you do with your physical body, as you get older, you, just, you think a little bit more about what you're going to spend it on. You've know, you got to do that with your, with your mind as well. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, you know, to kind of shift gears and talk about mm-hmm, because I've, first of all, I got to say, great name. It's one of those things where I heard about it the first time and I was like, okay, that's weird. Uh, interesting choice of names. But then now that some time has sat with me, I'm like, genius. Uh, that is such a great name. You know, where did the idea you're using mm-hmm, right now with the background, can you tell us a little bit about where the idea for the product came from? Uh, and what exactly is mm-hmm for those who haven't heard about it? Uh, yeah, I mean, the name is straightforward. Basically, you know, it came out of my, um, uh, my product studio, which is called Old Turtles. And uh, for years, people have been saying, why'd you call it Old Turtles? It's such a weird name. What's up with the name Old Turtles? And so I was just like, all right, you think Old Turtles is a weird name? You know, hold, <laughs> hold my beer. Watch this, you know, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I just wanted a name that would make people stop asking me about Old Turtles, <laughs> which is, you know, complete success right now. So that, that's, that's basically it. But the idea was, um, you know, we were, uh, we started working on this in May. Uh, we were all stuck, you know, at home uh, because of the pandemic working over video and it was all just kind of dreary. Uh, and I was just trying to make it a little, you know, to make, working on video suck less and we went through this i went through the same stage i think a lot of people do i went through a lot of this like oh look at me i'm in a crazy virtual background mm-hmm. and yeah i just noticed that this doesn't this doesn't actually help it's kind of a novelty uh but that uh if uh, if i just do this instead of if i just like instead of having a full full you know image background if i just kind of box it up put it behind me like a nice painting or something it immediately started to feel better and so that's what we did. We just wrote an app that uh, lets you do that. Um, we called it Mm-hmm. Uh, and our, you know, our, our it, it's funny, uh, you know, I do a lot of like startup coaching and things like that. And uh, a lot of startups have, you know, what's your elevator pitch? And I'm always like, you don't need an elevator pitch. Literally, you never need an elevator pitch. Because like, if you're ever in an elevator with me, do not pitch me. Right. Like, stand as far away on the other side and like, please don't talk to me in an elevator. Certainly don't pitch your company. You actually don't need a 30 second pitch. You don't, you never need a one minute pitch. You don't need a five minute pitch. You need a pretty solid 20 minute pitch. You need a pretty solid two hour pitch. And you need a pretty solid one second pitch. Uh, and it's the one second pitch that, you know, no one ever has. And so we had a one second pitch, which was a uh, instant weekend update. Mm. Like, doesn't work right. for everyone, but a lot of people know what this means. It's a cognitive familiar style. Uh, and so this was our one second pitch. Oh yeah, it's instant weekend update. Once you live out your your John Oliver uh, fantasy. Um, and so that's it. So basically, you know, I've got a room and a screen, and I can I can control them independently. So I can be in like a very fancy, realistic place with you know nice wooden uh, uh, bookshelves and that kind of stuff. Or I can you know I can be somewhere a little bit more trippy and psychedelic. Um, I sort of like this uh, calming paper cutout lake world that we made uh and um there's a screen behind me and i can put whatever i want on here you know images videos pictures i can do phone demos uh 
easiest thing, the, one of the highest impact things to do is to present this way. It's like throw a presentation mm -hmm. back here and, uh, you know, change slides and I can like, I can go whoop and shrink and get out of the way and still, you know, point to things and blah, blah, blah. I can go full screen and I can, uh, you know, I can become a, a Jedi ghost and fly around and, you know, point to things. I can do that with, with I can do it with a co-presenter. So I can have multiple people doing this and I can make recordings. Uh, so that's the basic idea is it's just a, it's a way to improve your performance over video for, for individuals, for groups, for teams. Um, and it's a pretty simple product. It's a pretty simple idea. I started out literally as a joke. Like we were just joking about it and started hacking around on it and then just took on a life of its own. And who, I know that you said that you kind of made it for the team, right? Cause you guys were all working remotely and we're kind of getting sick of zoom meetings, I assume, but who is, has mm -hmm, kind of changed? Is it still for remote workers kind of doing, you know, calls and doing presentations or has it now more evolved into being something that you see being used by creators like myself or YouTube creators who want to use it kind of like the John Oliver type thing? Yeah, I mean, it's still, you know, it, it hasn't evolved much, but it's still very early, right? It's only like literally like three months from when we started working on it or three and a half months mm -hmm. or something. Uh, still in closed beta, um, but we'll be, you know, we'll be launched soon um, uh, for real. And then we've got, you know, we've got some, you know, tens of thousands of people who, who have used it. Uh, well over 100,000, you know, applied for the closed beta in the first month. Uh, and so we're just starting to see like real use cases like mm -hmm. for real, uh, like real individuals. And, and they're pretty amazing. It's um, a lot of it is teaching, which does, which makes sense. So we've had a lot of pickup from, from teachers who are using this to teach, from students. Yeah. Um, we've had a lot of interest from um, from sales teams, from founders who are using this to pitch for you know, fundraising. Uh, it's got a big footprint in churches. So a lot of like clergy, religious institutions, which again, like totally makes sense. Yeah. That was actually interesting because uh, we, we expected it that would happen this time. But that was one of our first, one of our first big communities at Evernote that we totally didn't plan for. I just had no we're idea. Churches. Yeah, we're churches, clergy. Like we, we started really early on seeing clergy using Evernote, which makes sense, right? If you've got like, you've got, you have to say something interesting once a week. You're going to need a place. Yeah, to like, you got to write it down somewhere. Write it down and clip things that you see that are interesting and take notes and have it be distributed. So it totally made sense. So we like clergy was like one of our first power user use cases. And this time we kind of expected that. And yeah, it's true. Like we were getting some, some good use in religious institutions, reporters, investors, uh, that kind of stuff. But I think there's, um, I think there's basically three primary use cases. Uh, the video meeting is really just the first one. And it's probably the least important. I think that the, the second use case is what you're talking about is the creator use case. I think this is, this is going to take longer to get that flywheel rolling, but it has a much more, much bigger long tail. It's for people who want to make things. And um, uh, in fact, we were originally, the original code name for this was um, Twitch for Olds. We were calling it, we, we thought this was for, it's, it's Twitch for people who want to stream their PowerPoint presentations instead of Fortnite. Uh, and <laughs> it works for that. It was great for like making YouTube videos. You can also make interactive recordings. Um, which are super cool. You can like make, I can rec make a recording from here, like a pitch deck and I can send it and the audience can view it like a movie or flip slides like a deck. And so it's like a hybrid between a, oh, between okay. sending a PowerPoint deck and a movie, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third use case is really kind of reinventing every use case to be fully hybrid and fully video first. So how do we reinvent teaching and healthcare and you know banking and performance and there's there's just like a lot of these i think i think this is i think we're in the beginning of a literally multi trillion dollar new industry um, that, what do you, you mean know, by video first because when i when i hear video first what i think about is sort of like distributing content so for me as a podcaster it's a lot better for me to record this podcast in video like we're doing now and then syndicate it out into like you know my podcast and the youtube channel and then pull like content from it, you know, in like little clips. But what do you mean by video first? Well, I think the big change in the world, and probably this is better than, than saying video first, but I think the big change uh, is, uh, is this, is that everything is hybrid. Like from now on, uh, everything in the world is uh, hybrid. And hybrid in kind of a specific way. Um, if you imagine kind of this dimension uh, where you have um, experiences, right, on this, on this dimension of in-person to online, 
and then you cross it with uh, live to record it. So you're going to have this two by two, right? In person online versus live to record it. You have these four quadrants. Um, in the before times, like, you know, eight months ago, uh, almost every experience fit neatly into just one of these categories, right? So like concerts were like live and in person and YouTube videos were recorded and online. And once in a while, there was like a hybrid use case. Like uh, maybe like sometimes you'd have a board meeting where like a bunch of us were in the same room, but somebody would dial in. So that would cross over. But other than with very few exceptions, the boundaries between these core quadrants are pretty rigid and things basically stuck in the one place. And the big change is from now on and forever, the, the, the membranes between these four quadrants is, is melting away and we can now make experiences that are natively hybrid, that, are, that exist as a mixture of in-person and online and live and pre-recorded, uh, kind of hybrid native, right? And the idea we, if we make experiences that are hybrid native, um, we can make them better than they ever were. So we're, we're calling that IRL plus or better than in real life. Right. The concept is rather than saying like right now, a lot of people are doing this. They're kind of saying, man, X sucks over video. It's not as good as it was in, in, before, like, uh, you know, teaching. Oh, teaching is sucks over video. It's not as good as uh, it was before when we were all in person all the time because it's harder to keep the students attention. But, you know, maybe if we work on getting, you know, better microphones, maybe we can make teaching on video almost as good as it was before. And our philosophy is almost as good as a non-starter, almost as good as like really hard to achieve and kind of pointless and stupid. Instead, you got to jump to ridiculously better than it ever was. So the question is not like, how do we make teaching almost as good as it was before? That's a really hard problem. The easier problem and much more worthwhile is to say, how do we make teaching ridiculously better than it's ever been? And you can only do that not by trying to recreate the old experience in the new technology, Like you're not trying to recreate the classroom setting of new technology, you're saying, if we just reinvent what teaching is, but we have all of these four quadrants, we can like mix and match online and in person and live and pre-recorded and fluidly transition between those. Can we envision a way that we can teach that's much better than it ever was, much more effective? And like, yeah, of course you can. And then how do you do that for banking? Uh, how do you do that for, for um, uh, you know, for performance? How do you do that for healthcare? Um, so that's the, that's the concept. So it isn't really so much about video. video Video will play a fundamental role in this hybrid reality, but the whole point is that it's a it's a mixture of synchronous and asynchronous, live and pre-recorded, in person and online. The whole world recreated. Um, we're, we're calling the the category for individuals uh, PVP, uh, personal video presence. Right. So the concept here is like, um, you know, in the before times, eight months ago or so what percentage of us regularly and routinely had to interact with important parts of the world over video? It's like very few of us, but now almost hundred percent of people and forever will have to like do something important over video, even after like we start traveling again, because like we're just going to have these hybrid experiences. And mm -hmm is the thing that sits between my face and the rest of the world when I'm interacting with it through a camera. And for organizations, it's, it's much more profound. It's still PVP, but it's, it's professional video presence. Um, and this is like, this is the huge opportunity. Uh, basically think about it like this, like, um, when I started my first company that we're talking about engine five, right. In 1997, we were having this debate about, uh, what percentage of companies are going to be on the internet. And some people were saying, Oh, 25%. And other people were saying like, that's crazy. It won't be more than 2%. And we were like, we think it's going to be a hundred percent. And you know, it was a hundred percent, right? Same thing. So. Eight months ago, what percentage of every school, gym, restaurant, church, store, you know, company, club, what percentage of all of the organizations in the world needed to conduct themselves regularly over video? It's like a tiny percentage. But now and forever in the future, close to 100% of organizations are going to need to do something meaningful over video. And that entire industry is going to get created. And so it's, this is going to be as important as the dot-com uh, transformation was in the late 90s, early 2000s, like as, as big, but faster because it took 10 years for .com to become ubiquitous. It took 10 years for like every organization to, to, to have to be online. I think this is going to happen in like 18 months. So we're talking yeah. about probably, you know, a, a few trillion dollars of value that will be created in this PVP professional video presence category that we're trying to inaugurate and play in. 
I'm really excited to hear you say that. Cause I mean, obviously I'm a huge fan of remote work. I like, you know, it's one of those things where like, once you go remote work, you don't go back, you know, especially if I think a lot of people right now who don't enjoy remote work are kind of confusing working remotely during quarantine versus working remotely when the world is open, you get to enjoy all the different benefits. And like the way that I decided that this was the space that I wanted to play in was that I kind of thought about like, okay, what do I believe about the world in 50 years? And based on those beliefs, how do I make decisions now? And one of the things that I saw happening, and I think you kind of say the same, the same thing is that remote work and this sort of like global culture is going to continue growing. And like, I was almost like, if Elon Musk is talking about, you know, having bases on the moon or on Mars or whatever, you're going to have to do remote work. You're going to have to do video calls in order to get work done. And so if that's kind of like where we think it's going, then, you know, be where kind of the, the puck is going. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the latency on video calls to Mars is going to be pretty bad. <laughs> we're going right. to need a different model. Uh, but yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll have to be upgraded for, for then. Well, no, I mean, they already have the, the, the combination of synchronous and asynchronous, so we'll just have to dial mm -hmm. that in differently. Um, I think one way to think about it is this. Um, there's two types of buzzwords in life. There's buzzwords that are obviously just stupid and meaningless, like, you know, blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's buzzwords that sound stupid because they're going to take over the world and become ubiquitous and we'll have to stop saying them. So an example of that is dot com, right? Dot com sounds asinine. I don't know. I don't know if you remember, you know, back when everyone used to run around saying dot com dot com. You know, Sun Microsystems had a slogan. You know, we put the dot in dot com, right? And all sorts of stuff like that. So like dot com was a big buzzword. It, it meant like getting getting your business or your company on the internet in some way. Dot com. Right. Everyone was saying dot com. There was all sorts of you know, how, is dot com going to be real? And it was obviously a buzzword and it was obviously stupid, but it was stupid. It sounds stupid because you can't say it anymore because everything is .com. Every single right, company right. went there. And so it's like, you know, in, in 1998, you could say, oh yeah, this is a .com. You couldn't say that now because people would be like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, of course, everything is, right? And then the next um, buzzword that uh, started to sound stupid because it, it was right and it took over the world was mobile. Right. When we started, um, when we when we started with Evernote in 2007, everyone was about mobile. Oh, what's your mobile strategy? You know, investors had mobile theses, and companies would be like, "Oh, we're a mobile company." You know, we're mobile, mobile, mobile. And no one says mobile, right? Because like everything is mobile. Not because it didn't pan out, right? But because it succeeded, obviously and intuitively, and now it just took over the world. And so, in 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 2008, you could say mobile. By 2012, you weren't really saying mobile anymore because everything was. Um, and so remote is the next version of this. There mm -hmm. won't be such a thing as remote work. When people listen to this podcast in 10 years, they'll be like, what are they talking about? <laughs> what, is remote, deal, right? what is remote work? Like, oh, oh, okay, I guess like they'll have to like, they'll have to jump through the same hoops as we would have to jump through now when we hear .com and be like, what, what does that mean? Oh yeah, right. I guess the, I guess it wasn't obvious that that was going to be a thing. So there's no there's no such thing as remote work. There's just work, mm -hmm. um, and obviously parts of it are going to be done, you know, at a distance. But like remote from what? None of it is going to make any sense. It's all mm -hmm. it's just going to happen this way. Uh, and yeah, of course we need to like let's plan for the world where that is so ubiquitous that there's not even a word for it. I love that. I'm curious. You know, as somebody who's currently living in San Francisco and has spent quite a bit of time in Silicon Valley and, you know, seeing the world in the future as, as one in which anyone can work from anywhere. Where do you see the future of Silicon Valley and these sort of like tech hubs going? Because right now there is a bit of like, it almost seems like an exodus from Silicon Valley. And there's multiple causes for that, I'm sure, you know, one of them being covid uh, but I also feel like a lot of people have all of a sudden realized, and it's something that I thought was going to happen in 10 years. And I think COVID was just like, nope, it's happening now, where people have realized they can get their jobs done without coming into the office. And so now they're having to question, 
why should I live in San Francisco and pay those prices? Why can't I move out to the country or whatever? And so what do you think the future of, you know, these tech hubs like Silicon Valley is when everybody can do their work from everywhere? Yeah, well, I think, I think two things. I mean, first of all, it's not true that everyone can work from everywhere. And it's not, it's unfortunately not going to be true. I think that'd be nice if it were, but it's, it's clearly not everyone. It's mm-hmm. clearly people with a, a certain type of, you know, knowledge work. Right, uh, right. There's lots of other people that are in more, you know, service industries or other things that, that just don't have that opportunity. And so that's, just, like, it's important to not get carried away with this. Like, in fact, thinking through that growing division is very important because that that is going to become a central feature of society is the distinction between whether or not you can work from anywhere or not. There's going to be people who can, there's going to be people who can't. And how resources and everything else get split across that dimension is going to be like profoundly important. I don't think, I don't think most people like know what that's going to be like. So that, that is like very much a thing not to gloss over. And yeah. it's also up to us, I think, as technologists to have an opinion about this and to try to like, try to move the world towards a better place in this, in this, in this way. Um, in terms of, you know, Silicon Valley, uh, I think I, I kind of look at it a different way. Uh, I think that one of our core philosophies at, at All Turtles um, was this is something uh, that uh, I got from my, my, my friend and, and former partner at General Catalyst, Nico, who says, um, uh, exceptional talent is very rare, but evenly distributed. Uh, but but not evenly distributed, sorry. Mm. Exceptional talent is very rare, but evenly distributed in the world. Another way to look, think of that is that like talent is distributed evenly, opportunity is not, right? So if you think about like exceptionally talented people, like Mozart's, you know, they crop up, they crop up everywhere like mushrooms, but in most parts of the world, they can't do anything. If they happen to like crop up near Stanford, then like great. But if they happen to crop up almost anywhere else, then like much less great. So the great news about what's happening now is, uh, yeah, I think Silicon Valley is going to loosen up. And I think like people everywhere else in the US and and in in many other places in the world will be able to have the same resources and the same opportunities if they're really talented as people now have when they're in San Francisco and in Silicon Valley. And that's not saying anything about what will happen to San Francisco. That's just saying that like, it is an extremely good thing that I am all in favor of and trying to push mm-hmm. and make happen that, yeah, like people should be able to have the same opportunities as they would have here, so they should be able to get them everywhere. And, and that is definitely gonna happen. That's definitely gonna become more democratic. Um, what does that mean to like living in San Francisco, I think is a less interesting question because mm-hmm. that only affects a very, very, very small number of people who actually live in San Francisco like me. Maybe it gets better, maybe it gets worse, but the short answer is who cares? Most people don't live here. Most people are going to live here. That's an irrelevant question for them. The really important question for, for, the, for the larger world isn't what happens to San Francisco. It's how do we distribute the opportunities that currently are unfairly concentrated in, you know, in and around San Francisco and, and, and Silicon Valley. And how do, we, how do we get as much of that to the rest of the world as possible? And obviously that would be a net good thing. And I kind of tend to think that it'll also make this geography of Silicon Valley like nicer to live in as well, but maybe not. And again, I don't, I think that whole, that whole question is just several orders of magnitude less pressing because it just affects mm. far fewer people. Yeah. I had an interesting conversation with, um, a, a girl who moved from LA to Cincinnati here to start her startup because she got pulled into a, uh, she applied for a local accelerator. And the thing that she, I'd never thought about this before, but she mentioned that the reason it was so difficult for her to come from the West coast to run her startup out of here is that she felt like if her startup failed in LA in California, no big deal. She could just go on to the next, you know, great tech job. But here in Cincinnati, she felt that there wasn't as much opportunity. And so if she failed here, you know, the repercussions would be worse, even though she could technically just move elsewhere, but that was something that she considered. And for me, that was one of the like really big things that I was like, if remote work does become far more popular, which COVID happened afterwards and, and it has, I feel like it will make it easier for these sort of tech innovations to come from elsewhere, not just from the coast where there's some of this maybe job security in some way. It, it, was, it was an interesting way that I hadn't really thought of the problem before. Yeah, I mean, I, I look. I think 
anyone who is afraid of failure to an extent that it would it would actually control what they do shouldn't be making a startup because mm. you're very 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 likely to fail right? <laughs> right chances are your startup will fail like <laughs> that's right that's just the case so if that's a really big deal for you then don't do it uh obviously you should be afraid because you know some amount of fear is 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 necessary and healthy in fact you you know you can't be brave if you're not afraid i, I hate the word fearless the word fearless gets tossed around and i'm like fearless people are idiots because they're the only way you can literally not have fear is if you're too stupid to understand what's actually going on. Right. What the world needs is more brave people. Uh, but yeah, but if you're going to let the fear of failure, which is totally justified, because if you're making a startup, mm -hmm. you will probably fail. Just that's the odds. So you should be afraid of that. But if you're going to let that stop you, then yeah, you just you shouldn't start. Um, in terms of like responses to failure yeah it, it is one of the things that silicon valley has been very good at you don't get penalized much for failure of a certain kind you know you can fail in lots of different ways you know as long as you're not failing the same way multiple times you're demonstrating learning behavior and i think the rest of the world will you know move to that because it's a healthy attitude i am never again i don't think going to be in a position where i'm hiring people and i'm hiring people at least knowledge workers in a in a particular geography like i don't think i'm ever gonna like we've got i think 17 job listings now open for mm -hmm. i'm never gonna write another job listing i hope that says oh yeah i'm looking for a machine learning engineer in san francisco like right that's never gonna happen again i'm always gonna say i'm looking for a machine learning engineer and that is such a superpower right this idea that like Wow, I've just expanded my 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 search area to the best people anywhere in the world, not yeah, just in absolutely. this tiny little region. Like, what would I pay for that? Would I pay for some like, okay, but we miss in person times? Sure, fine, done. Get rid of that. Like the ability to to work with the best people from everywhere in the country and everywhere in the world is such a vast superpower that like even even if we had a hundred percent effective vaccine tomorrow. And even if tomorrow everything's like, okay, everything's back to the way it was, you know, in January, I still wouldn't be saying, oh, okay, I guess that means we're only hiring engineers in San Francisco now. I'd be like, no, no way. Of course we're going to hire them from everywhere because I've, I have now seen that it's possible to do it and to be super productive and that we're never going back. Now that's not going to be true of every single job in every single company, but it'll, it'll probably be true almost of almost everything that I'm ever involved with. Yeah. I think like, you know, companies that were able to function uh, remotely and meaning that, you know, their, their, uh, their teams were distributed, had a lot of benefits, right? Like you don't need to pay for uh, expensive office space. So you're saving on that margin. Uh, also, statistically speaking, there's a lot of research about the fact that remote workers tend to be happier, they tend to be healthier, they tend to be more productive, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so I almost feel like COVID was this stressor that, companies weren't going to make the transition without that stress occurring. But now that stress has occurred and they've adopted it, they've seen all the benefits. And even after COVID, quote unquote, goes away, even if they do go back, I think it's very likely that, like you said, they're going to be like, hold on, we saw the benefits. Why would we do that? It doesn't really make sense. I think the, yeah, I think, look, there's a lot of things that are worse remotely than, than in person. And there's a lot of things that are better. And whenever that happens, there's like things that are worse, there's things that are bad and there's things that are good for most areas of life, not for everything, not, not probably not for like pandemic management, but for like, for like most work related stuff, like when you have like good stuff and bad stuff, you just ignore the bad stuff or not ignore it, but like emphasize, lean into what's better and like yeah. just deal with what's worse, but lean into what's better. So in terms of hiring, in terms of just like what's, what's worse is, yeah, I don't, I don't get like, I don't, I can't have uh, serendipitous conversations just by passing someone in the hallway anymore and say, you know what, let's go for a walk and then walk for coffee and make an important decision. I can't do that anymore. I used to do that all the time. My central yeah. method of making decisions in, in, in the before times was, hey, let's go walk and then, you know, go for, go for a walk, drink some coffee and then make a decision. I can't do that anymore. I mm -hmm. thought that would be paralyzing to me, but it turns out that like, well, I probably shouldn't have been doing that to begin with. It's a little bit better to like document things better anyway. It just forced me to like be different. But the superpower that I got instead is the ability to work with anyone from all over the world rather than the people who happen to be in the same building with me. That is an order of magnitude more important superpower than, this, than, than what I paid for it, which is the inability to have to run into people in the hallway. And it turns out that if I'm just like, okay, well, 
no more, no more um, serendipitous, you know, coffee meetings. Great. How do we, how do I not rely on those and just come up with some structures and then lean into the superpower of being, being able to work with anyone from the world. To me, that's like, that's not even a close call. What's more important than those. And so for companies, all the things you mentioned are true, but the real superpower is you get to choose from, you know, 7.8 billion people. Right. You know, enough. And, and that benefit accrues the other side as well, right? If you're, if you are fortunate enough to be a knowledge worker, to be someone who can work like this, your chances of finding the perfect work-life balance or the perfect work-life integration are much better if you have infinite choice of where to live and infinite choice of where to work, right? You have like a huge search space here and a huge search space here. So your chances of finding like the two best options and putting them together is much higher than if you had to combine both of them and search in one narrow area, which just happens to be where you're currently living. So this feels like if, for the people who can participate, which again, not everyone's going to be able to participate. Mm-hmm. And we need to, we need to figure out what we're going to do about that because that's a big deal yeah. for the world. But for those of us who are lucky enough to be able to participate either on the company side or on the individual side, distributed work is, is by far superior. Yeah. Sort of um, heading towards wrapping up. I want to be respectful of your time. I do want to take a quick uh, selfish shift here. Uh, I, I read a, interesting quote that you had in Inc. Magazine in an interview where you said, um, if you want advice, find the people you want to talk to and ask good questions. In my experience, every single person I've ever approached with actual good questions, no matter how amazing and legendary they were, always took the time to answer them and was super generous with their time and their insights. People love giving advice to people who are actually paying attention. So as a podcaster myself, and I know uh, you have a podcast as well at All Turtles, what makes a question good? Wow, that well, I mean, that's a really good question. Uh, that's 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 something that I haven't like kind of formally thought about. But that's a really good question. So I guess one one thing that makes a question good is is right there. It's just like I I immediately have the feeling that I'm going to learn something just by thinking about and answering this question. Mm. Right there are there are questions that you learn so much from when you answer them because it forces you to synthesize things that you just hadn't previously synthesized. And that's one of them. So that's great, right? Anyone who's going to like, if you can ask a question that's going to make someone like actually be like, oh, wow, that is a non-trivial thing. And I would also like to know the answer to this question. <laughs> and like, I can probably come up with it, but I have to think about it and it would actually be useful for me to know. And I, I'm going to feel like I walked away knowing something and learning something important, even if I learned it you know, from myself in some you know, weird way, because I would, I had to arrange thoughts that were scattered in my head before. I think that's like a, that's already a, a, a great thing. Um, I think, you know, more obvious answers would be, you know, questions that you couldn't just trivially Google, right? Like if you could, if you could, if, if it was easy for you to figure this out with, you know, 10 seconds of Googling or reading the Wikipedia page, then, you know, asking me is probably not, not a great question. Um, another one is, uh, you know, Questions that are that have to be in good faith, um, especially now, meaning that like you actually want to know the answer and you're not mm. making a point. Gotcha. Uh, like, like you're not it, seeing a question that you know the answer to, essentially. In order to make a point, right? Right. There's right. there's a lot of like there's there's a lot of arguing or trolling or what is it called? Uh, there's like an animal. Is it sea lioning? I think it's sea lioning. Is like the meme. Yeah, I think that's what it is. You can Google sea lioning. I think I'm right about that. It's like sea lions okay. are assholes or something. So basically, you can it's basically. It's <laughs> basically. I don't the, think I've heard of this. Okay. Yeah, it's like the style of debate uh, when you're basically asking bad faith questions, meaning you're not you're pretending to be curious, but really you're not. You're just trying to like make a point. I gotcha. Kind of smell yeah. that. So yes, yeah, so I would say like a question that you're genuinely interested in, that you haven't that you wouldn't have been able to figure out by thirty seconds of googling, mm-hmm. uh, and that like. I, you know, if I can actually learn something by thinking through it, like that's, that's the trifecta, right? You don't necessarily need all three, but that would be, that would be the trifecta. And yeah, and, and in my experience, you know, I've been fortunate enough to uh, be able to get some really amazing people as mentors. Um, uh, and yeah, it's all just, just being able to ask good questions. Uh, I've never, I don't think I've ever approached like a CEO or a, a well-known person with a specific question and not gotten a good faith, you know, high quality answer uh, from, I don't think it's ever happened to me. 
Yeah, that's been my experience as well as I've also been very fortunate to, you know, meet and befriend some really amazing, very intelligent people. And I think that a lot of times you look up to these people and think that they're like, uh, like they don't want to hear from you or they don't want to be, you know, you know, questioned or, you know, all these kind of things, but you find out they're just like you and they're just as curious as you and they just want to have a good conversation. So, uh, and I, totally and I think, I think a lot of that is probably, I think we are kind of over indexed on that in, in the tech world or in the entrepreneurial world, because probably so many of the people that we look up to are sort of self-made. They're like kind of first generation in their thing. And so they remember what it's like being us. Yeah, that's a good right? point. Like, like it wasn't yeah. that long ago when they were in this position. It, you know, you're not like it's you know, it may it may not be the same if you're talking to, you know, royalty. Like the, <laughs> they have right. no memory of what it must have been like to be a peasant because they were never a peasant. They're you know, yeah, yeah. nine generations in. So I, I don't know. I haven't talked to too many of those people. Although, in all <laughs> honesty, I, I have met a few kings and they, they were pretty cool. Um, so yeah, so maybe it applies here as well. But certainly anyone who's like, you know, done something themselves. I found to be, to remember what it was like on the other side and to, to react, you know, quite, quite well to it. Well, listen, hopefully uh, we can do a second uh, episode because now we have got to talk about the Kings that you've met, but well, I, I was just thinking about that. that. I was just thinking like, it was, is that true? I've met, I have that was met just at, like a flex one. at the end. Definitely of... one, definitely one. Okay. Definitely one. And, and I think two Queens. Yeah. But so maybe, maybe Kings in plural, was wrong because now, now I, over the top of my head, I can only think of one actual monarch, well, male monarch, a couple of female monarchs. Yeah. But they were great. Gotcha. Well, you know, hopefully uh, you had fun on the podcast. I appreciate you so much <laughs> stopping by. And uh, if you did have fun, would love to do a second one to talk about the uh, monarchs that you've met because that's definitely sounds like a cool thing. But Phil, thank you so much for coming by. Um, I'd love to give you the chance to let people know where they can find out more about you or find out more about mm -hmm and all turtles and all the other cool things that you have going on. Uh, where can they go to find out some of that? Uh, yeah. So all hyphen turtles.com. Uh, is for anything about all turtles and uh, mm -hmm is just a mm -hmm, m m h m m. It's easy to remember because it's the palindrome. Uh, dot app. Mm -hmm, dot app. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.